All right, this evening we are going to uh, look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 actually is, exp is uh, expounding on the, uh, the verses that we saw this morning that concluded uh, the scripture reading in Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, one of the things we saw was that uh, if we will trust the Lord and walk in his ways, not only will he make our path straight, but he'll also heal us. Uh, it will be uh, healing uh, to our bones, refreshment to our bodies, and we were looking at what that might possibly mean. And I think what Solomon had in mind there was when we step out of the path of the Lord, when we lean on our own understanding uh, and go the wrong direction, uh, he will bring things into our lives to correct us and get us back on the right path. And so when we get back on the right path, the Lord will heal us. And that's what we really want to be looking at uh, this evening. So let's begin by looking at Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and reading Hebrews 12 verses 1 through 13. The author to the Hebrews writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives." It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful, yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble, and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now this morning we were considering, as I've already mentioned, Solomon's exhortation not to trust in our own wisdom, but to trust the Lord's when it comes to what we might call spiritually significant choices, the choices that we continually make in life. Now, one thing we do need to realize is that every choice we make in life has spiritual significance. I mean, think about what Paul means when he writes in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Even those things that we think are insignificant can either be done for his glory or not. So all of them are spiritually relevant, and we need to trust in the Lord's wisdom to make each one of these. Now, again, that's what we do in all other areas, essentially. I mean, how many of us are willing to trust our own experience and our own knowledge when it comes to our health, particularly when we're faced with things that look life-threatening? If you got run over by a car, you're not going to try to self-medicate. You're going to go to the doctor, right, because you need some severe treatment. You need somebody who knows how to work on you. How many of us went about preparing our own wills or our own trusts to make sure that our belongings get into the hands of those we want them to after we leave this world rather than consulting with a lawyer? 
Now again, if we're willing to seek help from experts in things that aren't nearly as important as the well-being of our eternal souls, how much more should we be willing to consult with God and trust Him, trust His wisdom in these things? When it comes to how we should live, we need to recognize that we have very little knowledge, we have very little experience. The same is true with our friends. But God has infinite knowledge and he has been pleased to give us a book that tells us everything we need to know and directions on how to apply this truth to our lives for his glory. Uh, we still struggle with sin. And because we do, we're never going to be absolutely objective when it comes to the choices we make. We're going to want things, desire things, and justify those choices out of sinful reasons. But God is absolutely pure. He's absolutely holy. And he is perfectly objective in what he calls us to do. And when we consider that the Lord really does love us and he wants the best for us, we can be sure that what he tells us is going to be the right thing. Now, Solomon also told us this morning that if we will trust his guidance, that he will do two things for us. First of all, he will make our paths straight. He will keep us on the path of safety. He will show us the right way to live. And that's what we were really focusing on this morning. But secondly, he said he would heal us if in his love he has had to discipline us because we've gotten off the path. Now, it's the second blessing that we're exploring this evening from this passage. And the first thing we want to see is this, that because God loves us, he disciplines us. Now, as we look at this passage, one of the things that we, we should see is that the author to the Hebrews is really telling us the, the same thing that Solomon was telling us this morning, only he's enlarging on that last point just a bit. Solomon's concern, as we saw this morning, was that we trust the Lord to guide us, trust his word, so that we'll stay on the right path. If we don't, he will lovingly work in our lives to bring us back onto the path. Now, the author to the Hebrews' concern is that we also set aside the things that will get in our way of following Jesus and <clears throat> run the Christian race. We might say this is the same thing that Solomon was, was exhorting us to do, uh, walking on the straight path, only in this case, the author to the Hebrews is expressing a little bit more effort. Instead of walking, we need to run. Now, if we don't, the author to the Hebrews tells us, God will lovingly discipline us to get us back on the path. Now, so let's take a look at, at what the author to the Hebrews is actually telling us here uh, in this text. Now, he begins by exhorting us to run this race. He says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I think what um, Paul has in mind here, of course, is, is a picture that's very familiar to the people of that time frame. Now, he's picturing essentially the spectators who've gathered in a coliseum to watch the games. The witnesses, he tells us, are those uh, from chapter 11 who have lived the life of faith and have made it to the end. But there is a difference between that analogy and what exactly is taking place with these witnesses and with what it is we're doing, as it were, in this Colosseum. The difference is that we're not there to compete in any earthly competition, but rather we're running a race, which is essentially living the Christian life, and we need to, rem to realize here that the author to the Hebrews is using the analogy of running a race, uh, of using it as a picture of living the Christian life. Okay? So we're not running an earthly competition, we're running towards heaven. And the witnesses that he's referring to are not there to watch us. Sometimes you might think that's what he has in mind. We have this cloud of witnesses who are watching what we're doing, but we understand the Bible nowhere tells us that those who are in heaven can see what we're actually doing here in the world. They're not there to watch us. Paul says they're there to witness 
to us. So they're not witnessing what we do. They're witnessing to us what they have done. And what it is they're telling us is that through the, te- you know, through the testimony of their own lives, that the life of faith in the Lord is the only way to live. And that it's worth whatever we must sacrifice in this race to make it to the end. Now, these witnesses are also telling us that if we are to run this race and to run it well and to make it to the end, there are certain things that we must be willing to do. First of all, they tell us we must be willing to lay aside everything that encumbers us, everything that weighs us down, everything that slows us down. Now, he's not referring to sin there, but what he's referring to are the things that are in the world which are not necessarily wrong things. They might actually be good things in and of themselves, but they can become wrong when we love them too much, when we set our affections on them too strongly and they begin to get in our way. Um, There's a lot of things like that. Anything really can, can happen or anything can become that to us if we're not careful. Don't love something too strongly. So we need to get aside, uh, lay aside the things that get in our way of living the Christian life. Uh, again, that could be in, in this world any number of things that might, again, in moderation be okay, but if we become obsessed with them, can get in the way. He, they also tell us that we need to lay aside the things that actually are wrong, the things that are sinful, the sin which so easily entangles us the things that break God's law, that offend His Holy Spirit, and that weaken our ability to live as He calls us to live. So laying aside the encumbrances and the sin which so easily entangles us, having put these things off, we need, the the witnesses are telling us and the author to the Hebrews, we need to press forward in our service to the Lord with the kind of effort an athlete puts into competing for the prize. Run the race. And he says, run it with endurance. It's a very long race. It's a lifelong race. It's going to take the whole of our lives. And because it is, it's tempting to ease up after a while. The witnesses are telling us that we must not slow down, but continue pressing forward until we reach the finish line. Now, secondly, the author to the Hebrews is telling us that in order to run this race, we do need to look to Jesus. Verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the author to the Hebrews is telling us that the witnesses of, of chapter 11 are very important. They show us that the life of faith is the only life that is worth living. But he's reminding us here that they are not the ones who are going to bring us to the end of the race. It is the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone that's going to do this. He is the author of our faith. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world and he lived and he died so that we might have faith to begin the race through his life He gave us life. The author of the Hebrews says he's also the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who is going to bring the race to its conclusion. He's not going to let us go. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 1, verse 6. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What it means is he will bring it to its completion. Uh, No one in whose life this work has begun will ever fail to reach heaven. Now again, we know that there are in the church sometimes uh, those that fall away, but as John reminds us in his first letter, they went out from us because they never really were of us. So Jesus is the author of our faith. He is the perfecter of our faith. He is the one who's going to make sure we make it to heaven. But the author to the Hebrews also tells us that Jesus is our example on how to run the race. Jesus set his eyes on the end of the race, the joy that the Father had set before him. 
And because he desired that so strongly, uh, the glory of the Father would give him the joy of being able to, to give honor and glory to his Father. He was willing to do what was necessary to make it to the end of the race. He endured the cross. When it says here he despised the shame, what it means is he counted the shame as nothing compared to giving glory and honor to his Father. And he obtained the prize. The Father exalted him to the place of greatest honor, giving him the name above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Now, the author of the Hebrews tells us we need to follow him. We need to fix our eyes on heaven. We need to endure whatever it is we must endure here so that we too might gain the prize again by his grace. So look to Jesus as the author of that faith. If you don't have faith in the Lord Jesus, he's the one who gives it. Look to him for that faith. If you have it, realize he's going to bring it to its perfection. Look to him for his example. He is, um, again, he endured whatever he had to endure, and he endured a great deal. We need to be willing to do the same. But again, there is that price we must be willing to pay. The same price that Jesus paid. We must be willing to endure whatever the world dishes out without compromise and without turning from the path. Then the author to the Hebrews continues in verses 3 and 4, For consider him, Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. Uh, let me just remind you that in the book of Hebrews, the, uh, the audience that the author is, is addressing here is, is a group of Jewish converts who are being tempted to go back into Judaism because the Romans were persecuting the Christians, but they weren't persecuting the Jews. Uh, at first, when Christianity was a new thing, the Romans saw it as a sect of Judaism. They thought it was a part of it, so it was protected. They were allowed to practice it. But as they saw the Jews persecuting the Christians, they realized that these were two separate religions, and they are in essence. And so they began persecuting the Christians, and that tempted some of them to want to go back to Judaism. The author to the Hebrews is telling them if they go back to what is about to be destroyed, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, they would be destroyed with it. So instead, they need to be willing to endure whatever they must to continue on this race and not to deny Jesus, okay? Now, Jesus was willing to endure what he endured in order to save us. The author of the Hebrews is telling them they need to be willing to do the same. And he says, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin, which is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done. Jesus ran a very difficult race. He was hated by his own people. He was betrayed by one of his own. He was crucified as a common criminal. And on the cross, he endured not just the, the pain that the other men were enduring on the crosses next to him, but our sins were laid upon him. And he endured God's full wrath against those sins on our behalf. Now, the author to the Hebrews is telling us, and the Lord is telling us through him, we must be willing to endure the same, to make it to the end, and to gain the prize. Again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Now that is a very tall order. I mean, how is it we're going to do this? Well, the good news is the Father is going to make sure that we do. Okay, he's given us his son, we've already seen, to live and to die for us so that we might be cleansed, so that we might have a perfect righteousness. Through his Son, he has given us his Holy Spirit to give us the desire and the power to do this. But there's an added blessing here that sometimes we don't think about, but it is really something that is active in our lives at all times. And that is, when we fail to do what the Lord calls us to do, when we grow weak and we don't stick to the track, the Father has committed himself to get us back on this road through what is called discipline. And he does that in love. And that's what the author to the Hebrews says next in verses 5 and 6. He says, You have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, 
nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. You know, in a certain sense, what the, what the, uh, the Hebrews, I guess we'll call them, were going through was actually a form of discipline. Because discipline is not just corrective always, it's, it's instructional always. So I think we need to make a bit of a distinction here to understand what discipline is because sometimes we mistake it even in our own lives as we apply it to our children. This is something every parent needs to know. Discipline is not punishment. Although we use that term quite frequently, it is not punishment because it has an altogether different motive than punishment. Now let me, let me tell you what punishment is. Punishment is, is basically dealing out justice the penalty for what is done that justice demands. When God punishes, he's giving the one he punishes what they deserve for the crimes they've committed. He is meting out justice. That's exactly what the Lord did on, uh, really to his son, the Lord Jesus, when he bore our punishment on the cross. Our sins were laid on him and he meted out justice against Jesus, he punished him for our sins. Now, if we've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to realize that our sins have already been punished on the cross. God will never punish us for the wrongs that we do because Jesus has already suffered for those sins. And obviously, God is not so unjust as to require a double payment for the crimes that we have committed. Jesus paid it all. But that's what punishment is for its retribution. And we're not to deal out retribution to our children. We are to discipline them, even as our Father disciplines us. Now, discipline is not punishment. What discipline is is one of two things. It can mean either instruction, such, again, is what the Lord calls us to do with regard to our own children. It means to guide them, to train them, to educate them. And this is what the Lord does for us. Through his spirit, through his word, through the trials he brings into our lives, such as the trial that the, the Hebrews were experiencing, that the author to the Hebrews is, is addressing here. But it can also mean to correct bad behavior. Okay, that's a part of instruction. That's a part of training. When our children go the wrong way, we discipline them. We discipline them because we love them so that they'll turn away from wanting to go down the direction that will ultimately hurt them and put them into a path that is ultimately good for them. Uh, that's the way we should be disciplining our children. And that is good. That's a good thing. We do that because we love them. We do that because we care about them. Well, that's exactly what our Heavenly Father also does for us. He disciplines us to correct us. Now, we just touched on this this morning, but he does this in several different ways, uh, depending upon what, what it is we're actually doing that needs to be corrected. Now, he applies the rod. It has, you know, the rod is not, you know, like a cosmic rod that comes down out of heaven that just sort of swipes you on the backside. But it's something that the Lord has various ways of doing. He might, for instance, trouble our conscience, convict us by his Holy Spirit, bring to our awareness the sense that we've done something wrong and cause us to grieve over that sin we've committed. That's one way that the Lord might actually chasten us or discipline us. He might take away something from us, uh, such as our assurance. You know, whenever we sin, we offend the Holy Spirit. When we offend him, it quenches his work, which means his influence in us isn't going to be as strong as it was before. And when his influence isn't as strong, then I think it takes away something of our assurance because it's the Spirit's presence in our heart that actually helps us to know that we do belong to the Lord. Now, the Lord will never take his Spirit away from us entirely. He will never cast us out of his family, but we can sometimes feel like we are not in his family, and we don't want to be in that kind of a situation. So that's meant to get us to draw near to the Lord again. And that's one of the ways we can know that it's the Lord who is doing it to us. It's conviction and not condemnation. The, the response should not be to try to get away from the Lord, but rather to 
come to him in repentance that he might forgive us and restore the fellowship that we had with him. He might take something away from us that's important to us. We're talking about those things that encumber us that may not necessarily be sinful, that might become sinful. He may take away from us the thing that has captured our hearts and that's making us turn aside from the direction we should be going. David writes this in Psalm 39, verse 11. With reproofs, you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Now, notice there's actually two things here. He may reprove us through his word. That's another way in which he disciplines us. But he consumes as a moth what is precious to us. That thing that's getting in our way, he'll eat it up. He'll, he'll take it out of the way so we can break free from it and we can continue to move forward. We noted this morning that he might touch our health. He might, you know, bring about some kind of illness. Now, not all of our physical problems or the other things that we have to endure in life come about because of personal sins. Remember Job? He lost his wealth. Everything was taken away from him in a day. He lost his family, I think on that same day. And he lost his health. But the Lord makes it clear it was not because of Job's sin. Job didn't sin through, through all of these trials and difficulties that he had to face. And I think we have to understand by that he wasn't absolutely perfect like our Lord Jesus Christ, but he essentially did what the Lord calls us to do. So why did the Lord do that to him if he hadn't committed any personal sins? It's because the Lord wanted to teach him certain things about himself, certain things about God, and he also wanted to show Satan that this man did not belong to him. So not all of our difficulties, not all of our illnesses are going to be connected to personal sin, but there are times when it actually is, when it is the result of personal sin. As we saw this morning, as we read almost every Lord's Day when we're celebrating the Lord's Supper, remember the Corinthians. Remember what happened to them. Many of them were weak and sick, and a number of them had died because they were abusing the Lord's table. So sometimes it is connected to that. Now, because discipline is instructional and discipline is corrective, we can't avoid it. And we shouldn't want to avoid it because it's important to us. The author tells us that if we are not disciplined by the Lord, if we don't receive his instruction, if we don't receive his correction, then we really don't belong to him. He writes in verses 7 and 8, It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which, we all, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Notice every child of God receives discipline. And if you don't receive discipline, he's saying you are not a child of God. It says here, I mean, the scripture tells us even Jesus in a certain sense, received discipline. He wasn't corrected for bad behavior because we know that Jesus never sinned. But he was taught. He was instructed. He was educated by his Father. Uh, the, uh, the Old Testament refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as one who was a disciple. And he had the ear of a disciple. And how his Father would wake him up morning by morning to teach him and instruct him. We also uh, read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 8 through 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And by the way, the things he suffered were all ordained by his father for this purpose. And having been made perfect, that is perfectly suited to be the high priest that God sent him into the world to be for us, going through all that we've gone through so that he could sympathize with our weaknesses and come to our aid. Having be been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So even Jesus was instructed. He was disciplined in that sense by his Father. Now since we are now his children through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father also teaches us. As we saw this morning in his word, he shows us the good and the right path. And 
he corrects us so that we might live the life he calls us to live, so that we might be holy, so that we might become more like him. We read in verse 10 of Hebrews 12, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. So we can't avoid discipline. We don't really want to avoid discipline. We want his instruction. But when it comes to correction for bad behavior, there are things we can do to minimize the discipline, at least, again, that correction we need for, for sin. Now, we know it's impossible to avoid sin altogether, but by his grace, we can avoid a great deal of sin. As a matter of fact, as Christians, we ought to be avoiding a, you know, a lot of sin that the world is involved in. Uh, he's already taken us out of the world, given us a new heart, made us go a different direction. We're already avoiding a great deal of sin, but we can avoid even more if we are strong in the Lord. The more we use what God has given to us in order to strengthen us, the more we yield to the Spirit of God, the stronger we will grow and the more we will avoid the sin that offends the Spirit, quenches the Spirit, and His work in our hearts. So we can't avoid discipline, we can't avoid instruction, but we can avoid perhaps some of the correction if we keep our feet in the right path. But again, let's remember, when we do step out of line and we fall into sin and the Lord sends correction and we need to be thankful that he does, there is something that he calls us to do in this passage. We're not altogether passive. We need to respond to the discipline. Listen to what he says in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble and make straight paths for your feet so that the limb which is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. What do we do when we, we basically fall into sin and the Lord brings discipline into our lives? The author to the Hebrews, using the analogy of the race still, says we need to repent. That's what he means here. By strengthening the hands and the knees and making straight paths for your feet. Get back on the path. Do what is right. We need to strengthen our resolve again to do what is good and right through repentance and renewing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if we do this, as we saw this morning, it will be healing to our bones and refreshment to our bodies. It will bring about healing because having learned our lesson, the Lord will remove the discipline from us. And of course, through that discipline, we will more likely than not be stronger than we were before. The Lord will teach us through our fall and our recovery. He can use even our sins to help us grow into his likeness. But the author to the Hebrews here is warning us of what will happen if we don't turn from our sins, if we don't repent under his discipline. He says this, his discipline will become even more severe. He says the limb that is lame will be put out of joint. And by the way, that's not a good thing. That, I mean, in a certain sense, that's not a better condition. That's a worse condition. And it means that the discipline will become even more severe. Now, what that tells us is this, is that God loves us too much to ever let us go. He's going to do what is necessary to bring us back. So if, if this certain level of discipline doesn't do it, He's going to intensify it a little bit more so that we eventually do come back to him. God loves us too much to let us go, okay? Now, we shouldn't use this as an excuse for sin, the fact that God loves us and he's going to discipline us and bring us back in, into the path. We should be thankful for that, but we shouldn't use this as an excuse for sin, but rather as a reason to avoid it. And the reason is this. Even though the Lord may work our sins together for our good and we might be the better for it, the discipline that we have to go through in order to reach that point is, is not a pleasant thing. The author writes in verse 11, all discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's a good outcome to it, but notice it's not fun. It's not pleasant to go through it. 
it is very, very difficult. And so something that, at least with regard to the correction, we, I think, will be better off if we can avoid it and stay in the path. We, we, we know that that's certainly what the Lord teaches us. So let's be thankful that the Lord loves us enough to discipline us, but let's stay on the path and realize that even if we don't stay on the path, God will get us back on the path. He will make sure that we arrive in heaven. He will make sure we run this race. He will make sure that we shake ourselves free from sin one way or the other. He will get us there, and we need to be thankful for that. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, let's ask the Lord to um, take what we've heard, help us to remember it, and help us to respond in the way that he would have us respond when uh, we are faced with discipline.